Welcome back to Five on the Floor. I am your host, Greg Sylvander. Today's floor plan with me, Alex Toledo. You can follow him on Twitter at Tropical Blanket. We are going to try to look past what was an absolutely awful game two and look ahead to game three and try to get into what some of those adjustments uh, could look like for the Heat in terms of what they might be able to do, do differently schematically as well as with the lineup. We just think it's definitely um, it's time to think about adjustments must be constructed. That's what the playoffs are all about. So that's what we're going to dig into today. But before we do, we're starting off with a great sponsor, particularly as it relates to that disastrous effort in Milwaukee last night. Do you have a water leak and can't find where it's coming from or you're dealing with water or mold damage? In your home or business, you call Water Cleanup of Florida at 954-579-0356. With over 60 years of combined experience, Michael, Robert, and their team are prepared to handle all types of leak detection issues, water damage issues. So once they find the leak, they can locate it, repair it, uh, and then fully restore the damaged area. That goes for water that comes in via storm as well. They're fully licensed, insured, and certified to provide the one-stop shopping that busy homeowners and business owners require. There's no need to bring in any other contractors, 24-hour emergency service. Their service areas include Miami Broward all the way up to Palm Beach County. Call Michael anytime on his personal cell, 954-579-0356. Again, that's WCUFL.com, Water Cleanup of Florida. Call Michael, 954-579-0356. If you got the schmutz, they got the guts. Okay. So before we start, I need to beat some allegations because I heard at the beginning. Wait, of the wait, last wait. Episode, we didn't do the intro. Good call. Look, I'm <laughs> trying to I'm I'm trying to exonerate myself so quickly. We're skipping the intro. Hit the intro. Gotcha. Down the best gang. Yay. Uh five on the floor. Ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing. You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck is saying, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing. Got an all band. Y'all seen the block. Stop with one hand. And Pat we trust. It's power have the guts. We here to bring the heat. Y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. And now, welcome back as we get uh, adjusted for this episode about adjustments. Welcome back to Five on the Floor. As I mentioned at the top, Alex Toledo and myself, Greg Sylvander. Um, yeah, I was ready to dive into... Um, uh, I almost skipped the intro because there was at the beginning of last night's uh, show directly after the post game, I heard Ethan mention uh, that there was a bet about whether I would make it up for the end of that game as it was such a blowout and it was late and I am up early and uh, I did not make the post game show and I did legitimately fall asleep. I'm not running away from, from the blowouts folks. Uh, Ethan has been spicy lately, right? I know the, the, uh, the allegations geez no um but anyway i'm back today it's alex and i we're talking adjustments for game three and there's a lot to be adjusted from i mean i feel like that game as much as it was it was such an opportunity for them to seize this series take control go back home with all the momentum and they squandered a game without Giannis. Who knows if he'll be back as we're recording this at 533 Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, 420. Uh, we don't know whether he's going to play. There hasn't been any updates. Uh, I have this weird feeling like if they're thinking about this long term, why not try to get one on the road without Giannis too? Uh, so I don't know that it's an absolute give any plays, but we've already seen that it doesn't matter. They could beat them anyway. So... Uh, Alex, I don't want to rehash too much of your emotions from post game show last night, but I know that you're going to get triggered because inevitably we have In to objectivity. talk about we have to talk about what happened last night to get to the adjustments that are going to happen on Saturday night. And again, we'll have you covered on playback for that as well as post game, pre game. You know where to find us. So let's start here, Alex. Starting lineup. Um, Duncan was the surprise. Maybe not so surprised, Tyler Hero uh, starter. And then um, that didn't work. Max Struess played 31 minutes and 
that didn't work. And so it looks like they probably need to investigate here, particularly when you saw how bad they got carved up early. Is it as easy as Caleb Martin slides in for Duncan and we move on with this conversation? Or do you think that there's more to more to discuss about lineup, starting lineup specific adjustments for game three? Well, of course, I don't think it's it's as easy as that, even though that is kind of my answer. Um, I ultimately would probably vote for Caleb to be that guy. But there's like I said, like I've said over and over again, since we started talking about the Bucks, there is no easy answer, especially now. The context is different, right? You don't know if Giannis is going to play game three. I, I, I'm assuming he's going to play until further notice, right? Just like I was assuming he was going to play in game two. Now he's going to have a few more days, rest it up, and he's obviously nursing some injuries. His game is built on his incredible physicality and, and just getting to the paint over and over. So it's going to be tough to play that way when you have Bam on you. I just think the defensive effort was so bad to start off that game, and they weren't able to – to go from there like it's it, it was bad in the first quarter right like you had a bad defensive uh first quarter and then you got i think outscored in the first by seven and then you go into the second quarter like okay this is the time that you're supposed to clean things up right kind of get it back in your way get get the momentum away hold start threes and really be sharp on defense it was a complete opposite they got outscored by like 19 in the second quarter and the game was over from there right and just right like for, through three quarters they were out rebounded by 13 because we know the game was kind of over by that time. So that's kind of what I, um, I, I was kind of looking through some stuff here and I decided, I think the first three quarters is probably the best yeah, representation. That last of that quarter game. is a throwaway quarter for sure. You could, could have probably for an earlier in that third, but I just did three quarters to be clean, right? They got out rebounded by 13. You had three more turnovers in them. And then everybody wants to talk about the three point shooting, which yes, like they're not, they're probably not going to hit 21 threes again, but the heat do allow, the second most threes in the league, the Bucks take the fourth most amount of threes in the league. That's what they've done. That's what they've, you know, done this season. That's what they've done in the entire Giannis era. They hit it at a really good rate, too. They hit it at a top 10 rate. And still, even if they don't make that many again, like, I was more upset with the, the pain effort and the point of attack effort. And I just think all of it was bad. Like, I thought their closeouts were bad. I thought kind of the, the boxing out was bad. And also, it, it was tough to blame some guys just because of the small items that were thrown out there. You know, it was just a complete mess from everywhere. I think you have to take yourself out of a position where you're overcompensating all the time, and it's hard to do because this um, roster is not really built to do that, right? Unless you yeah. start seven large. I mean, I'm kind of open to it. I just, I'm not sure that's where Spo is going to go to. Um, I don't know, man. I really don't like what happened. The, I think Caleb Martin is probably the safest option as the fourth best player. I think you need another defensive guy out there. He's hit his threes. But, man, like, they shot 60% from the field and 60% from three through three quarters. Like, that. that's – all of that is not an anomaly. All of that, I think, was just more to do with the way they executed. Yeah, it's – because Milwaukee's done it all year, right, and Miami hasn't. So when you look at game one and Miami shot 60% from three, we call that more of an anomaly because they ain't been doing that all year. Milwaukee, um, by contrast, obviously number one record in, in the Eastern Conference. This was the game that they had to have. And, um, like, I guess I'll ask this because you're right. It, it, like, the three-point shooting didn't really – once it got just ridiculous and they're just making every shot and Joe Ingles is like shooting sideways, uh, fadeaway shots and stuff like that. Um, it got a little ridiculous, but early on, it wasn't about the three pointers. It was about them letting guys get into the paint so easily. I mean, is, are, are do you think that they could potentially play more zone than we've seen them play, which I guess is a little weird when the three point shooting was so strong, but we know where the root cause is, right? So could it be that that zone ends up being a factor here? Is that an overcorrection on my point to go there? And I'm obviously oversimplifying for the sake of time. Well, look, I think zone is not a bad idea. Um, whether you do it with the love at the five minutes or the bam at the five minutes. Um, I personally, and obviously Spo is the best coach in the league, all of that, right? I'm not here to uh, start talking down on him. I just got to use that premise because then I think people start thinking that I'm of a, like fire Spo camp and it's like, 
no, that's that's not what I'm saying. I will say personally, I wasn't a fan of going back to switching, and I wasn't a fan of the way that they were matching up in general, where it felt like Bam was matched up on Supportis instead of Brook um, a lot more often than I'd like over the night. I, I think Portis is a guy who, yes, he's a dangerous player. He can get buckets, but I think having the smaller guy on Brook instead of Portis was weird to me. I think I'd rather let Bobby try to use his size to put up some jump shot there, whereas Brooke Lopez was a small guy. I don't want to paint like you're going to have to send early help or he's going to score on you. Like the guy is huge and he was a 20 points per game for, for a long time in the league. He can still do that stuff if you put a smaller player on him, which is what they did pretty much primarily, whether they had like whether in the first matchup or as they were switching. It was, you know, Bam was never on him. And that's, I think, I think was a mistake in a game where there's no Giannis, where you didn't have to have um, Bam matching up onto Giannis. I, now you might have lost that opportunity, right? Because I think they're still going to go back to Brook uh, in the post. It'll probably be a little bit tougher for them to do it because Bam might be able to sag off Giannis, help help into the paint. But I think the 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 Bucks are going to go back to that, and they've they've already seen like that's a weak spot in the way that the Heat are matching up there, whereas they did not attack it at all in Game One. So I think between the lineups, between execution of defense, like there's so much that they got to work on. From game two and again they're gonna have to go in with two different game plans because it it changes radically um if Giannis is in the game I understand like switching some of those actions but the thing is it just I think it got Brooke a lot of good looks he he was 10 of 15 through three quarters um I think it got him a lot of offensive rebounds I mean I haven't even looked at the the offensive rebound margin I just looked at the overall um but it also got them a, a whole lot of open threes. Like they kept scrambling the heat defense over and over oh, yeah. and over. Completely and it, out of place. And, uh, you know, like I said, they always give up threes. But the, the real, I think, signifier of whether it's a good defensive effort is those the closeouts. Usually if the closeouts are not completely wide open, it's because they're sharp and they're on a string. Right. You can't say that for every time, but that's kind of a good way to, I think, Imagine. distinguish between – you know, good defensive possessions or not, because the, usually if the guy is not rotating out to close out at all, that means somebody was late. That means somebody didn't do their job. There was a breakdown somewhere. People are having to overcorrect all of that. I, I just think top down, it was a complete mess on the defense. I'd like to go back to go back into a drop, whether or not um, Giannis plays, just have Bam matched up onto the big man, whether, you know, whether it's Giannis or Brooke. And again, this is why I'm open to, um, putting Kevin Love back into the starting lineup, even though I really liked what he's brought as a backup five and think it's a natural fit for him. This this Bucks team is just one where you might have to go to solutions like that because th- there's just no easy answer. And I keep going back to it. I, I don't even mean to keep saying it. No, but-, but it's 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 so applicable. And even Eric Spolstra was like, you know, when they asked, and I think this quote was taken out of context a little bit, but. You know, they're asking him about Max Struess ending up on Brooke Lopez, and he's like, yeah, that's something we got to we gotta figure out or something like that. He didn't really have an answer either, it seemed like. Um, and to your point, maybe, you know, I'm so quick to go to Caleb Martin as the starter. Maybe you're right. Maybe they end up going big. And, and Kevin Love, um, who had a kind of a reduced presence in game two, ends up with more in game three. But the other thing is um, – they got to get Jimmy Butler more involved. And I know that obviously this game is we a little wonky because of it was such it's such a blowout, but still only 12 field goals. Um, the other part of this is like, I think they're going to just need Jimmy to take over offensively. This team's not good enough to score enough points to, to, to beat this team. I know through two games they're hitting overs and that makes us feel like we're scoring a ton to me. I want to see an aggressive Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. So I'll be interested. They just added this prop on prize picks, y'all. Field goals attempted. I'm interested to see where Jimmy Butler's comes in. And that leads me to our daily fantasy sponsor of the Five Reasons Sports Network, and that is prize picks. Y'all know the code. Y'all know the app. This is where you play daily fantasy. Super simple. You're choosing your favorite players, your favorite stats, choosing more or less. Do they – um Go over or under the stats. Use the code 5, F-I-V-E, to get your initial deposit matched up to $100. So you can do things like uh, Joel Embiid, more or less than 18.5 field goals attempted tonight against the Brooklyn Nets. I would go over on that one, for instance. 
Super easy, a lot of fun. Use the code five. It's daily fantasy made easy. We all play it uh, here at Five Reason Sports Network. So you can always see us uh, tweeting out the different picks and stuff like that. But then we also have our gambling sponsor and that's Better Edge. A lot of people ask what's Better Edge and why is it different than any other betting platform? Better Edge is a social betting marketplace. Users buy and sell betting positions without a VIG instead of a traditional sports book where the book is setting the price and accepts your bet, it takes fees and pays out the winnings. Better Edge Marketplace connects users on opposite sides of bets at their own set prices. So it's really fun to do that way. Uh, use the code 5RSN and you'll have $20 to play immediately. We do competitions related to the playoffs, but you can do all of uh you know, the, you're betting there, find the lines you want. 5RSN will get you $20 of free play money right off the bat. Better edge. That is our daily gambling or our um, official gambling sponsor. So let's just, I guess, talk about the very top of the roster. No Tyler Hero. So we knew this was going to be more Jimmy and Bam focused. It, I thought Duncan and Max had to have huge games, and I was hope trafficking in game two about them stepping up. Neither, I guess Duncan was okay, but I feel like I don't know how much of that I'm trusting in terms of yesterday's game. Um, what what does Jimmy and Bam need to do to elevate this group uh, coming into game three? Role players play better at home is like the hacky sports take that I guess people can maybe lean into. This team does not feel like that applies to their home games. Uh, so I feel like Jimmy and Bam have to be where this starts and finishes. Let's start with Jimmy. Uh, adjustments from Jimmy Butler in game three. Honestly, it's tough to come out with any. And I don't mean to come out with such a cop-out answer because I think Jimmy can only do so much. And I think similarly with Bam, I think Bam can still do more. But um, Jimmy obviously can take it up to a different level. We all know that. I, I just think like last night they had pretty efficient offensive games. And now it's gotten to the point where without Tyler, there's such a reliance on the shot making from everybody else. And there's going to have to be right because of the way that the, the, you know, the series has played out with no Tyler and also because of the way that the Bucks defend with their deep drop. Like they're going to be relying on a lot of guys to make a lot more shots than they did um, last night. And obviously on the defensive end, you have, you're relying on the Bucks not going absolutely berserk and Novocaine, whatever you want to call um, what they did last night. It was just, um, you can't let that happen again. And I think the thing that Jimmy and Bam can do is set the tone defensively. Uh, that's kind of what I'm looking to see more. Again, I, I know I, I really harped on that already um, last night and again today with the defensive stuff. I kind of think they did what they had to do offensively. And um, I remember kind of looking midway through the third and they had like a decent half-court offensive rating. It's like they were, I think they were making enough shots where they're good at, right, in the mid-range uh, at the rim. Obviously, the Bucks are very good at not allowing shots at the rim and, and they were kind of making the ones that they got. It was just the defensive end. Like, you're constantly um, giving up points, and they, they never had a chance. They never had a chance with the way they came out, and, and it was just kind of Jimmy and Bam scoring for no reason. So, yeah, I think you need Jimmy and Bam to, obviously, there's there's a lot of pressure on them now for both of them to give you big-time scoring games. Like, Jimmy cannot cruise. He's going to have to give you 30 points a game. Bam is going to have to give you – and you know me, I'd never say points per game ever. But, like, it, sometimes it, it does come down to it. Like, you get now – Jimmy and Bam are just going to need to give you increased production. You know that you're going to get it out of Jimmy. Bam has kind of, you know, I think been willing to take the, the shots that we all see are open for him uh, all season playing against the Bucks. I know he had a weird first half in game one, all that. He was still taking the shots, right? And yeah. I don't think he's, he has everything as figured out and as polished and, and mastered as Jimmy. And I think that's where people got to cut him some, some slack because he's really trying to take these shots that are – being given to him. And like I said, time and time again, I think especially now without Tyler out, you're going to have to find ways to get Bam easy points. And I think a lot of it is probably going to come down to the way that they execute their pick and rolls, their handoffs, whether it's their guards or a guy like Max getting to him, uh, you know, the little pocket pass off the pick and roll, just easy looks here and there because everything can't be a kind of isolation. Uh, <laughs> Bam, wait, Bam waits for the look. And then when they, when it's, 
when it's done, he just has to take a, you know, he steps into a midi that, you know, Brooke with his 7-5 wingspan has his arms all over. Like, they've got to do something more than that because every shot can't be that. And I think that's kind of, there's going to be more of an onus on Spo now to to figure that out because his team, obviously, with Giannis, is, it's just really hard to get anything at the rim. You got to get him something easy at the rim. You got to get him at least some easy pocket passes for in rhythm mid range shots, as opposed to everything having, you know, him having to create himself. It's, there's just nothing. There's, there's, there's nothing I can even say other than you really hope that the shot making goes your way next time. And they're, they've been a really good home team all season compared to what they are on the road. Right. And I think that's what you can kind of be optimistic about. But then, like I always uh, like to bring up, they lost uh, three straight home games in the conference finals last season. So I don't even, it, it still just left me with a sour feeling. But I think Jimmy and Bam have to set the tone um, defensively and obviously now have just a lot of pressure to do even more scoring. They really do because the Heat, I mean, they're shooting 56% in this series and 50% from three. But like to me, that's not sustainable. Like they're eventually going to sink back down to their regular season averages or close to them. What were those? 46%. I'm looking here, 35% from three. Like if they regress further, this is going to be more about Bam and Jimmy. And to your point about this being not as much about adjustments offensively and more about defense, I'm looking through here as I'm really like drilling into the numbers did you know that their 25 three-pointers on 49 attempts tied an NBA record for three-pointers made in a game? They had 46 points in the second quarter. Their largest lead was 36. They didn't have Giannis. All I'll say is that um, as they head into this next game, and I think they're a five-and-a-half-point favorite as it stands right now, um, I really think that they have to start strong and i said it before the last game and it didn't materialize and it proved to be an issue because i feel like once the bucks get flowing i don't know that there's much miami can do so this is about getting off to a good start playing tough defense um and then it's just it's jimmy and bam in the half court as much as possible because the idea that you can rely on max and duncan to come through i just don't know that that's going to be reliable game over game at home we shall see alex any final thoughts before we close oh man final thoughts um, you hate the final thoughts question you could also just say hell no and we end this no. thing i mean look man i just it, i really was heated up not even to use the pun or anything like that no pun intended last night because of the way they came out and i think they they, they botched an opportunity to really take control and you know People who go up 2-0 win 77% of the time or whatever the stat is, right? right? It's you, you just put yourself in such a position where all the pressure is on the Bucs. Um, they had to win last night. I don't think that he came up with the requisite effort or not even – I don't know if, if effort is even the right word. They didn't come out with the requisite um, execution needed. I do not – they were whatever the opposite of sharp is right now. Yeah. I can't even find the word. That Dull. For. <laughs> it was <laughs> – yeah, I mean, I just think everything that, you know, they have to be the opposite of what they did last night. And I understand you can just kind of be like, oh, you know, they're not going to shoot that well again. That's what they do, right? When Giannis is out, that is what they do. They're going to rely on Drew and Middleton to create stuff for them. And, you know, the Heat have a small guy matched on to Brook so much, they were relying on him. They, he was one of their hubs of offense for sure. Like, you have to, I think, clean some of that stuff up. But not only that, you have to actually execute the stuff that you're doing right like they even even if i like i said on last night's show if i disagree with the switching they 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 weren't executing that well at all everybody was out of place it was chaotic a whole lot of scrambling a whole lot of open shots in the paint a whole lot of open shots from three it was a complete mess right and i think you have to you really have to be sharp from the start you're the eighth seed you're the eighth seed you have to play like you're the eighth seed you have to play like every game is going to be your last, like not to be cliche, but it's no, true. but it's true. I mean, the margin of error is so small. Just execute the game plan to a T. I know it's way easier said than done. It's probably the best team in the league from a two way perspective when Giannis is on the floor. But we saw in game one that there is a game plan that they didn't do it and compare them apart, even though it was it was a different game plan, right? But all the Bucks do is shoot the damn ball, man. And I think you kept giving them open ones because of the way that you were matched up in the first place and because of the way that you weren't able to contain them in any part of the floor. 
So I think if they go back to being a defense for defensive first team, like they're supposed to be, then they've got a shot because then you can just kind of hope and pray that um, the shot making goes your way at least a little bit where it's not, you know, they're doubling it up or tripling you up and three pointers made while the game is still a game because Obviously, the way the, the you know garbage time played out last night, it, it made the the score and, and some of the stats look a lot better than, than it was. what they actually did. But for yeah, sure. for sure. And let's I guess we'll close by saying we don't want to see Max Struess on Brook Lopez. So let's hope they figure something like that out. The more we've talked here, I'm almost like at the end of this show convinced that maybe it is going to be Kevin Love that and gets inserted into the lineup. We will have you covered tomorrow with a um, another episode. Ethan will be back, uh, kind of looking at some big picture angles as we head into Game Three. Uh, adjustments will be big, and we're interested to see what they will be. As Ethan or as Alex said, um, you know the game plan is the game plan, and we know what the game plan is. We've seen it work once. It's going to be about execution. It's going to be about the small details, and uh, Game Three. I think I think I read somewhere if a series is 1-1, the winner of game three goes on to win the series 75 or some crazy percent of the time. So game three seems to, appears to be pivotal. We'll see what happens. Thank you for joining us. Peace out. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.